Island of the Blue Dolphins, Chapter 2. Captain Orlov and his Aleut hunters moved to the island that morning, making many trips from their ship to the beach of Coral Cove. Since the beach was small and almost flooded when the tide was in, he asked if he could camp on higher ground. This my father agreed to. Perhaps I should tell you about our island so you will know how it looks and where our village was and where the Aleuts camped for most of the summer. Our island is two leagues long and one league wide. And if you were standing on one of the hills that rise in the middle of it, you would think that it looked like a fish, like a dolphin, lying on its side, with its tail pointing toward the sunrise, its nose pointing to the sunset, and its fins making reefs and the rocky ledges along the shore. I'm going to pause here for a moment because I want to talk about the word leagues. It's a unit of measure. It's a way that things um, are measured in distance. So a league is about three miles. Really, it's like two and a half to almost five miles. But right in the middle, um, it's about three miles, give or take. Whether someone did stand there on the low hills in the days when the earth was new, and because of its shape, called it the Island of the Blue Dolphins, I do not know. Many dolphins live in the seas, and it may be from them that the name came. But one way or another, this is what the island was called. The first thing you would notice about our island, I think, is the wind. It blows almost every day, sometimes from the northwest and sometimes from the east, once in a long while out of the south. All the winds except the one from the south are strong, and because of them the hills are polished smooth and the trees are small and twisted, even in the canyon that runs down to Coral Cove. The village of Gallus At lay east of the hills on the small mesa near Coral Cove and a good spring. Here's a picture of a spring. It's a water source. Fresh water. About a half league to the north is another spring. And it was there that the Aleuts put up their tents, which were made of skin and were so low to the earth that the men had to crawl into them on their stomachs. At dusk, we would see the glow of their fires. That night, my father warned everyone in the village of Galisat against visiting the camp. The Aleuts come from a country far to the north, he said. Their ways are not ours, nor is their language. They have come to take our otter and to give us our share in many goods which they have and which we can use. In this way shall we profit. But we shall not profit if we try to befriend them. They are people who do not understand friendship. They are not those who were here before, but they are people of the same tribe that caused trouble many years ago. My father's words were obeyed. We did not go to the Aleut camp and they did not come to our village. But this is not to say that we did not know what they did, what they ate, and in what they cooked it in. How many otter were killed each day? and other things as well, for someone was always watching from the cliffs while they were hunting or from the ravine when they were in camp. Ramo, for instance, brought news about Captain Orlov. In the morning when he crawls out of his tent, he sits on a rock and combs until the beard shines like a cormorant's wing, Ramo said. And remember, a cormorant is the bird with the beautiful shiny black wings. My sister Ulop, who was two years older than I, gathered the most curious news of all. She swore that there was an Aleut girl among the hunters. Quickly, I want to pause and just get into my mind. We've got Karana, who's 12, Ramo, who is half of her age, which was six, and Ulop, who is two years older than her. So 12 and two is 14. She is dressed in skins just like the men. Ulop said, but she wears a fur cap and under the cap she has thick hair that falls to her waist. No one believed Ulop. Everyone laughed at the idea that hunters would bother to bring their wives with them. The Aleuts also watched our village. Otherwise they would not have known about the good fortune which befell us soon after they came. It happened in this way. 
Early spring is a poor season for fishing. The heavy seas and winds of winter drive the fish into deep water, where they stay until the weather is settled and where they are hard to catch. During this time, the village eats sparingly. That means the village doesn't eat big, huge meals. They eat what they need to eat to survive sparingly, mostly from stores of seeds harvested in autumn. Word of our good fortune came on a stormy afternoon brought by Ulap, who was never idle, meaning she never stood still. Ulap was always moving. She was never idle. She had gone to a ledge on the eastern part of the island, hoping to gather shellfish. She was climbing a cliff on the way home when she heard a loud noise behind her. At first, she did not see what had caused the noise. She thought that it was a wind echoing through one of the caves, and she was about to leave when she noticed silvery shapes on the floor of the cove. The shapes moved, and she saw that it was a school of large white bass, each one as big as she was, pursued by killer whales which prey upon them when the seals are not to be found. The bass had tried to escape by swimming toward shore. But in their terror, they had mistaken the depth of the water and had been tossed onto the rocky ledge. Ulop dropped her basket of shellfish and set out for the village, arriving there so out of breath that she could only point in the direction of the shore. The women were cooking supper, but all of them stopped and gathered around her, waiting for her to speak. A, a school of white bass, she finally said. Where, where, everyone asked. On the rocks, a dozen of them. Perhaps more than a dozen. And before Ulop had finished speaking, we were running toward the shore, hoping that we would get there in time, that the fish had not flopped back into the sea, or that a chance a wave had not washed them away. We came to the cliff and looked down. The school of white bass was still on the ledge, glistening in the sun. But since the tide was high and the biggest waves were already lapping at the fish, there was no time to lose. One by one, we hauled them out of reach of the tide. Then, two women carrying a single fish, for they were all of about the same size and heavy, we lifted them up the cliff and brought them home. There were enough for everyone in our tribe, for supper that night and the next. But in the morning, two Aleuts came to the village and asked to speak to my father. You have fish, one of them said. Enough only for my people my father answered. You have fourteen fish, the Aleut said. Seven now, because we ate seven. From seven, you can spare two. There are forty in your camp, my father replied, and more than that of us. Besides, you have your own fish, the dried ones you brought. We tired of that kind, the Aleut said. He was a short man who only came to my father's shoulders, and he had small eyes like black pebbles, and a mouth like the edge of a stone knife. The other Aleut looked very much like him. You are hunters, my father said. Go and hunt your own fish if you are tired of what you are now eating. I have my people to think of. Captain Orlov will hear that you refuse to share the fish. Yes, tell him, my father said. But also, why we refuse? The Aleut grunted to his companion and the two of them stalked off on their short legs across the sand dunes that lay between the village and their camp. We ate the rest of the white bass that night, and there was much rejoicing, but little did we know, as we ate and sang, and the older men told stories around the fire, that our good fortune would soon bring trouble to Gallus at. As a reader, I'm thinking, hmm, trouble? So the author, Scott O'Dell, has given a clue that something is going to happen next in the book, some sort of trouble, because Karana talks about their good fortune of the fish coming and them being able to eat and them rejoicing, being happy about it, would soon bring trouble at Galisad.